I grew up in a poorish country, really, and then in the 80s it was a period of recession, and that's when I invented the Jimmy Rabbit and the band and his family. And I started thinking about, um, well, how would they be doing now in this new recession? How different is it? I thought it'd be, I didn't want to write about economics, I don't know how, and I've nothing to say, really, but uh, I just thought, well, you know, um, how would they be getting on? What are the differences between this recession and the previous one? And I just I decided to add basically a quarter of a century to his, to his age and drop him. Having escaped one, just dropped him into a brand new recession to see how he'd get on. I had written short stories about middle-aged men since I was about 40, I think, around about then, turn of the century, really. And, uh, you know, one or two a year, as, as little episodes in my life struck me as being not necessarily the material for a story, but they'd spark off an idea for a story. But they were always short stories, very definitely short pieces of fiction, never novels. But I wanted to write a novel about a middle-aged man, you know. And Jimmy, sadly, in a way, is a middle-aged man. He's 47. And I thought um, I'd give him a form of cancer, not out of cruelty, but um, a form that, if detected early enough, would allow, you know, the probability of a long life. So, for example, this notion, you know, as his children are getting older, as and as people's children get older, you know, this notion of what do we do for the rest of our lives, you know, because you suddenly feel redundant, because you're not ferrying children from A to B and bringing them to football and bringing them to, you know, the usual middle-class pursuits or anything like that. And you, suddenly you find yourself with nothing to do on a Saturday morning, you know, and it feels, which is probably good news, but it actually feels like a loss, you know? So Jimmy, w with the possibility at, for, at the beginning of the book that he won't be around very long, is, con is confronted with an awful lot of these questions. A little bit, of, I'd imagine, like a professional sports person being confronted with retirement at an age where most of us think it's very, very young, you know? Uh, for those two reasons, I brought him back. Well, you reach an age, at some time in my 40s, uh, I noticed I'd regularly meet friends for a pint. We've been doing it since we were very young men. We met in school before we would have been able to have pints. And then, you know, we've kept in touch and we meet. Uh, it's been an open arrangement every Thursday night. Late every Thursday night, we have a few pints and we have a laugh and a chat. And usually, up to a certain point, the agenda, if you like, carrying up from our teen years, music, football, uh, then, you know, our children, in one or two cases, our grandchildren, uh, work. But then about 12, 13 years ago, cancer arrived as well, you know, on the agenda. People we knew suddenly we, or we knew very well or knew of uh, had cancer of various types and there used to be five of us met around the table and now there's four another friend had cancer of the bowel and he's fine so that's why I gave Jimmy cancer of the bowel you know but since even writing the book I've lost another friend now I meet these people you know people I grew up with in their 50s and uh, most in 50s and some of them touch in the 60s and we're meeting at funerals because all the old neighbours are dying I moved into the house I live in at the moment with my family 10 years ago and uh, before we moved in I converted the attic into uh, an office and uh, I think my last three novels have been written there. And I keep uh, kind of nine to five, nine to six actually hours. So I couldn't work on a novel all day, you know, that's why I write for children as well and I do screen work or whatever. So I divide the day but I usually start with the novel, put it away for a while and then go back to it. And it accumulates quite, I, I, you know, particularly when I'm just starting. If I can get about 1,000 to 1,500 words a day, that's, a, that's, you know, leaving aside quality, that's a, a reasonably good day's work from my point of view. You know, I live close to the city centre in Dublin, but it's also beside the sea. And uh, the geese fly over the house at 4 o'clock, virtually at, at almost exactly the same time, in the same direction, heading back to, you know, the sea. And they fly over the house at four o'clock, and I always think, oop, I better get a bit of work done, you know. <laughs> I look at them first, because it's a glorious sight, this amazing sight. It always reminds me of the, um, the flying monkeys in uh, The Wizard of Oz. And they just go by in Battle of Britain formation, and that's, that's kind of announces I'm on the home run now, but I better get some work done. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> I listen to music, yeah. It's rare enough I wouldn't. If I'm editing, I don't. Or if I do, it would be something like maybe one of Brian Eno's longer pieces. Uh, something by Philip Glass or something by Steve Reich. The rhythm of those minimalists, uh, they probably don't like being called minimalists. don't think I'd like it much myself. But the rhythm of that work uh, it kind of infects me somehow. And I, I get a lot of work done when I listen to, say, Music with Changing Parts by Philip Glass. Now, if I ever met him, I'd say thanks because I, I, several books have been finished, uh, pushed along by that.
piece of music, you know. I'm, uh, yeah, coffee is the, the um, it's the one thing I'm probably snobbish about. Get up there before everybody else in the house, and I have a cup of coffee, uh, espresso, and do a bit of reading, you know. Then when everybody else is uh, up and running, those that need to get up and go out of the house, I uh, make another cup and head upstairs. But I, it's almost, I'm probably not literally incapable of going up to the office without a, co a coffee in my hand, but I'd find it really hard. But I love rituals, you know. I don't have um, any religious convictions or feelings at all, but I do like little rituals. I love vinyl instead of, uh, I, you know, I do have an iPod and I do, I think, what can be done is glorious, but I do love taking the record out of the uh, out of the packaging and putting it on the turntable and lowering the needle onto it. There's something almost religious about that, and I find the same with making coffee. I'm well disciplined, you know, um, so I might uh, and I, I interrupt the work with that. It's like a commercial break, you know. I need it probably as well to a degree, but I I also have a blocking, you know, app. It's childish, I know. It should be self-disciplined, but I just block it for maybe an hour, two hours, so you know, I get a rush of work done. So um, I feel a bit guilty about that, having to buy an app that'll stop me from watching the internet. You know, but there you go.